20, Exodus chapter number 20, please. Uh, looking forward to this evening. Uh, the study tonight has to do with the second commandment, and that, of course, is going to be found here in the book of Exodus chapter number 20. Uh, last week, as a reminder, we went through the first commandment, and thou shalt have no other gods before me, gave the reason for it. Now, the reason he gives in verse number two is very instructive when it comes to the rest of the commandments, but it's, a spe it's specifically tied into not having any other gods before him. Verse two, it talks about the he's the Lord that brought them out of the land of Egypt. And so that's the one that's done that work, a redeeming work, right? And so anyways, when it comes down to verse number um, Verse number five, I'm sorry, verse number four, we're going to get uh, a little bit more information in regards to uh, another commandment. So now we're about to double the number of commandments we've gone through. So the first one is thou shalt have no other gods before me. The, uh, the importance of that, of course, is not just that there is not another God, that like all the other gods out there should be ignored. Literally, there are no other gods, and he's not going to share that, that glory with another. Um, in that, he has done that work, and so hence, he should get that praise. He's the one that should get that glory, and there's nothing else that should get the glory. In other words, nothing else should get the credit for what God has done. He refers back to the fact he's the one that brought him out of Egypt. Nobody else should get that credit. And the idea is God and God alone. So when we talk about God and God alone is that there's no other. The second commandment is very similar to us. Let's go ahead and read that in verse number four. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in, in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. And so verse number four through verse six is the entire commandment. This is actually important uh, because oftentimes we'll give the title as far as no graven images and uh, we miss a lot there. We add or we take away from what it's talking about when we just kind of just mention that. It's okay to give it a title, but we have to understand there's a greater context in that. Um, so anyways, in this passage of scripture, we have not just the fact that it's who we should serve or whom we should serve, right? Being, being God, God alone. But the second part has to do with how we should serve or how we should worship. When it comes to this passage of scripture, he has already laid out the groundwork. No other gods. Now, if, I want you to think about the, at least what I've been thinking about in this one. If God says no other gods, then wouldn't the next one as far as no graven images kind of just fit? I mean, you have no gods, no other gods, hence no, no graven images. And what happens is, in, uh, in the first and second command, we, we combine them. We put them together. And so the idea of like, okay, no other gods and no idols. Well, isn't that kind of saying the same thing? Uh, well, the idea here is not actually the same at all. And so when we have the concept in regards to it, and by the way, in verse number, uh, verse number four, the second commandment, there is no question that idolatry is something that's to be avoided. But that's not actually the commandment here. In fact, you'll find it repeatedly all throughout the scriptures about the necessity of avoiding idolatry. The book of Leviticus talks about the idols of the land, the destruction of them. The book of Deuteronomy repeatedly talks about destroying idols, but that's not what he's talking about in this occasion because we've already narrowed down a certain role. He is the God. He alone should be served, so that's a commandment. So based on the information, he's the God that's done this. He alone is the one that should be served, God and God alone. Secondly, there are not to be any graven images of him. There's no graven images of him. Now, does that mean, oh, well, great. If I'm, allowed to, if I'm not allowed to have graven images of God, does that mean I can have graven images of everything else? Well, no, because there's plenty of scripture that talk about that. Um, but in this, it is, it is specific. Now, we're going to try to put this together as far as what we're talking about here. But I want you to take your Bibles to the book of Exodus really quick here. Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter number 32. And uh, we're going to look at an example of something that takes place. I jumped all the way to Deuteronomy for some reason, so let me go ahead back. Exodus chapter number 32. Um, so what has happened, according to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 4, we find out some information in regards to what's been taking place and discovering, or not discovering, but receiving the law of God. According to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I encourage you to read that on your own, but when the Bible explains in verse number 13, he explains that this is the covenant that's given to them. Right before it explains that the people heard the voice they heard the thunder they didn't see god they just heard they heard the law given to them and then moses went up and so they heard it they went up they were given the law and so while they're waiting 
Moses is up there, and he's there for a long time. So don't just think Moses went up there like, all right, guys, let's go ahead and have some idolatry going on. They went, and I'd imagine day one wasn't a problem, day two, maybe a week, but he was there for a long time. And so after a while, 40 days up there, um, the people get this idea in their mind, hey, let's do something about this. because They've been waiting a long time. But anyways, in that, um, we understand that, that God, God gave them this, um, these, these tablets of stone, which God himself wrote the Ten Commandments on these tablets of stone for them to be able to have. Um, while they were there, while he was re- they were receiving them, the people get kind of impatient. And by the way, it's important to know from the Deuteronomy passage that they knew what the Ten Commandments would be. They, they already knew. It's not that they had to guess. They didn't know. Um, they knew what they were going to be. So they weren't just blindly saying, we'll take anything you say. They, they accepted the terms in regards to what that, that covenant was. And so in chapter 32, in verse number 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Now remember, Aaron is, uh, what's his relationship to Moses? Brother. His brother, all right. So he's got his brother. Uh, big brother, by the way. So Moses is big brother. Um, Aaron uh, is, is the priest, and uh, he's been selected to be basically the mouthpiece for the most part in regards to the work that's been going on in Egypt. But they're out in the wilderness, and they, everybody gets close to Aaron, and said unto him, up, make us, what's the next word? God. Gods, lowercase g, plural, right? So the request from the people is make us plural gods. Now, this would have been similar to what they had received in the past, where they've been around Egypt, been there for a long time. Egypt was incredibly idolatrous. Uh, we talked about some of that last week. But up, make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. In other words, we don't know what happened to Moses. And by the way, it's scary. Up there, it's like loud and thundering and smoke and all sorts of stuff. Like, he just, he probably didn't make it. And so uh, let's figure out something else to do. And so they said, we need gods. Would you make us some gods? And, and notice what the desire on this is, is that they would, that he would, um, make them those gods that they're they're desiring would you make us gods now for us in america that's really difficult for us to comprehend people wanting that but that's what they've been around that is the religious system can i remind you that when it comes to the idea of physical idols when we think of that being ridiculous remember we have to remember that any other thing that you believe besides the gospel is ridiculous and so you're like oh no this is normal and american well that's just because that's the way you grew up and so if you believe something else, it was ridiculous compared to what the truth of the gospel is. And so don't think like, oh, I can't believe they were into idolatry. Whatever we were into was wrong. And so with that, we have to bring it up to the same level. Now going into this next passage, in verse number two, and Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the, by the way, this is, I'm not going to uh, preach a whole message on this, but notice where, who has the earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your who? sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me and so the boys and the girls they all had earrings that's not saying it was okay all right they were they were idolatrous in this pursuit uh, not only that uh, it seems and we can i don't, don't want to stretch this in too much here but the idea um, would be a slave type relationship that these people had while they were in egypt hence they would be marked by earrings and so anyways with that break it off by the way that represents something old before that and so you could say, well, maybe it's just decorations. Um, the other thing, and, and I've done some reading onto this, and I'm just telling you my imperfect knowledge about this, but a lot of the earrings that I've found from the Egyptians are almost entirely idolatrous. And so they, they are designed around the gods of Egypt. And so they're snapping off earrings that would either represent, based on some scriptures, uh, that would either represent their ownership to previous masters or idols. Now, it's possible maybe just... They, they like pretty earrings, and so the dudes put on earrings as well as everybody else. It's possible, but, you know, it's, we know that whether it ever was, it was wrong. They should have been doing it. So in this, the idea here is time to get rid of that. But what they do with that, they replace it by giving it to Aaron. Aaron says, give me that stuff, so it's specifically the earrings. And so apparently there's enough gold in them. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the, um, at the, the remnants of what they found in archaeology from the Egyptians. It's almost entirely pure gold as far as what's used for the for the Egyptian earrings. And so there's, there's actually a lot of them. You can find a good, good number of them. And so anyways, um, that being said, this is what he asked for, for those earrings, bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. 
And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, you'll notice who's speaking here. Well, a couple things happen. First off, he gets this gold. Apparently, it's enough to he's going to make an image. Um, I, I don't know if it was a movie or a picture or something. I remember seeing where they made like this calf, and it's like this full-size oxen made of gold. It wouldn't have been like that. More than likely, it would have been something small uh, because he, he graved it. So it wasn't like a full carving like you would think of like chainsaw carvings out of a tree, something enormous. This would have been something that he's using a graving tool. So this would have been some detailing going on into making this thing. It's possible he's just really good and carved out this gigantic thing really quickly, but it seems that it would be smaller. So imagine just this golden, golden calf is made. And anyways, when they make this, their response is they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now notice what it says in verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Notice how it's spelled in verse number 5. In verse 6, it says, these be thy gods, lowercase g. In verse number 5, at the very end, tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. Now, you have to remember when we see that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in that way, as it's listed here, we're talking about the name Jehovah. This is not a God. This is God himself, properly called. And so we're talking about God himself. We're going to make a feast until the Lord. So the, notice that the request was God's. Aaron makes how many? One. He fashions it. He makes it nice. Maybe put a lot of detail into it. But regardless, he does this thing. They said, these be the gods. And he says, this is for the Lord. We're going to have a feast for the Lord. We make an altar for the Lord. So we're going to have the celebration about the Lord. And the whole point is that this God, capital L, Lord, uh, God himself, capital G, if we would say it that way, is representative of the one that Aaron has been serving. But he's saying, here it is. And so the question is, does Aaron believe in a bunch of other gods? It doesn't seem like it. In fact, from this, it seems like we can, we can take a lot of this and point out the fact that he is pointing to the Lord himself. So he is not necessarily forsaking the first commandment, is he? That shall have no other gods. Because Aaron's saying, no, no, this is the feast for the Lord, for the one God. Commandment number one is being followed. Commandment number two is what's being violated. That shall not make unto thee any graven image. And so this is what they do, of course, in verse number six. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, there's actually a lot in this verse um, because it, the one thing is it is a feast to the Lord. The types of offerings that they use are also interesting, aren't they? Because they are burnt offerings. Uh, they are peace offerings. These are offerings specifically handling sin issues. And so this is about God. By the way, he hasn't given regulation for how that would be done yet, which means it was already being done. Um, but with that, he hasn't explained the whole Levitical system yet. And so they're offering this up. And uh, anyways, and they go rise up to play. A lot of scripture speaks about that in regards to the sounds of war, uh, what they did, Old Testament and New Testament cover, cover that. But because of what they did, so the feast, the celebration to the Lord, by this graven image, by worshiping this graven image, brought about something else. It brought about for them to do things that they shouldn't have been doing. It seems that with what they did, rising up and play, it wasn't just like they went and had fun, they threw around a Frisbee and barbecued some stuff. It had nothing to do with that. This would have been wicked ways of worship that a lot of other religions would have had at the time. In fact, it's not where it's, it's loud, it's terrible, it's, it's even scary in some ways. Um, and anyways, it's enough where God says enough is enough. There, there's a lot of consequence, obviously, because of that. And so you can look at the... Um, Actually, go down to verse number 8. We'll, we'll look at it together. And they, Lord, the Lord's speaking. He's telling Moses about this. Basically, you need to get down there. They have, um, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. In other words, they have the commandment, uh, which I have commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so when they say that these are thy gods, and yet there's only one molten image, one, one image that's been this molten, so it's been shaped by a molten process and then graved. And so you have a two-part process there. Um, but they give a plural 
qualifier to this. The possibility here is that based on the idolatrous earrings that were put in there, this is a culmination of multiple gods to have the one. And so it's, it's, a, it's a wrong understanding in regards to who God is, and so there's a lot to obviously learn for them. Um, but regards, in regards to this, uh, God is very clear. He's not okay with it. The other thing is that God makes it very clear. They are worshiping the calf. They are not worshiping God. And so they might say they are, but it doesn't mean that they are. And so, so the biggest thing we get from this is not just that they're worshiping the right God, but they have to worship him the right way. And we're in a society now that kind of God is what we want him to be. And I talk to a lot of people. I'll, I'll knock on doors. I'll talk to people in grocery stores. I'll talk to individuals, family members, and we'll tell them things in regards to who God is. And they will say something like this. Perhaps you've heard this. I don't think God is that way. I think, well, will God let you into heaven? Yeah, why? Well, you, you've done all these sins. Oh, well, I think that God will. Well, you can go ahead and kick, get that thing and just throw it out. Because we have to be able to say God's way is the only way. Even his abode itself, heaven itself, when we talk about its eternal state, when we talk about in the book of Revelation, describes the fact that nothing that will defile it will enter in. Why? It's his law. It's his law, it's his judgment, his purity, and this is the way it's going to go. And we cannot make an exception based on what we think. Our thinking doesn't matter. Our thinking doesn't change God. And so we have to look at this according to what God has. Um, in this, uh, I want you to look at one more passage, and that's going to be in 2 Kings. If you're in Exodus, you've got a few books to go. 2 Kings chapter number 9. And, um, and again, this is, this is a really interesting passage of Scripture. 2 Kings chapter number 9, uh, we know that uh, in the southern kingdom, there was a few good kings, right? So we have the nation of Judah, uh, has a number of good kings, some that seem to have uh, led in revival. That's wonderful. How many good kings did the northern kingdom have? Big old fat zero, all right? But there were some close ones. They were like almost there, okay? This is one of them, Jehu. Jehu in chapter number 9. Uh, let's go ahead and start in uh, verse number 4. Elisha sends a prophet to go up there and say, anoint this guy, uh, Jehu, to be the king. There was currently another king, uh, but they had been very, he had been very, very bad. Uh, that had been Ahab. And so um, God was going to go ahead and exact judgment on the family. So if you will, go down to um, verse number 4. So the young man, so this is another prophet. The young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the hosts were sitting, and he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, unto, unto which of all, I'm sorry, unto which of all, all us? And he said, to thee, O captain. And so he shows up, this young guy. Now, the idea of a young man, don't think of like somebody in their 30s. Like you're probably thinking somebody super young, like 37. Um, think younger, okay? So think like Aaron, all right? So he's, he's you're 20, 23, okay? So maybe even younger, all right? So, um. So somebody like David. So David, 17 years old. So 17 years old. Uh, 17 years old, you might think, okay, David's a young guy. Could you imagine? He's like, hey, I need you to go over there and uh, where President Biden and all his generals, or actually, not this, the better case scenario would be the generals. All right. So the generals are all meeting there. I need you to go in there, and I need you to tell the main general that he's now going to be president. And so this is, this is the situation. This guy runs in there. The generals, the captains of the whole army, these are the generals. They're all sitting there, the highest ranked positions. And, uh, and the young guy, he's a young prophet, comes in there. He says, uh, I've got an errand to, uh, I, got, I have a basically, basically a message to deliver. What's the message? Or with who? Um, with just you. Okay, so he pulls him aside. What's the message? In verse number, um, verse number six, and he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have appointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab, him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So he anoints him, says, hey, this is what's up. And then he takes off running. <laughs> he opens the door, just, whoosh, just, just a little cloud of dust behind his feet. And so he's gone. 
All right, so what are they going to do with this? Just to narrate as far as what takes place for the sake of time. Jehu, which is the general, uh, Jehu, who is working for King Ahab, he, uh, he goes and the other guys are like, so what did he want? Oh, uh, you know, the guy was, you know, he said stuff. Well, you know, you're lying. We have no idea what he said. Okay, what he said is, now I'm the king. Like, really? They take off their coats. They, they kneel down on them. They, they bow down to now the new king. There you are, now the king. Now, could you imagine, David? Nobody knows who David is. He walks in like, oh, by, your, by the way, you're king, and you got to kill all these other people. Sure. All right, so they all believed him. I mean, it's just literally that quick. It's pretty incredible. The other thing that's important is that the northern tribes, so Israel, was idolatrous, not just kind of idolatrous. They were fully vested in Baal worship. Jezebel had hundreds of prophets that worked for her. Now, that number had been reduced because 400 of them had been killed off. But the point is that there's still a whole lot of prophets that are working for, for Jezebel and the, uh, the kingdom. And the kingdom is given into this stuff. They had seen some spurts and, and little, little sparks of the possibility of revival. But the point is that this nation is idolatrous, incredibly idolatrous. So Baal worship is commonplace. The major temples are there set up specifically for Baal worship. Tax money is going to this. And so anyways, Jehu gets up and he says he does what God told him to do. He starts killing people. They go out and he kills um, a bunch of people. He, um, he kills Joram. Uh, he, kill, he has Jezebel killed. Uh, he didn't really kill her herself. They throw out her window and she gets eaten. Um, but then anyways, they have Johash. Um, anyway, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. I'm actually in the wrong chapter here. Um, so yeah, Jezebel is starting verse number 30. Uh, if you go down to verse number, chapter number 10, uh, Nahab had 70 sons in Samaria. That's a lot of kids. So before some of y'all like, wow, you guys have a lot with like four, five, eight, ten. Um, they had 70. Okay, so 70 kids. Ahab's got a bunch of kids. Um, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also in armor, look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, uh, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid. Behold, two, um, actually, so what happens is they send out letters, get all these kids there. We're trying to narrate a lot of, bunch of, stu a lot of stuff in this passage. So anyways, uh, what's going to happen is they bring them all in, and um, they, they gather all of the 70 kids together, and they set out a bunch of guys outside, basically, if anybody leaves, and uh, they get away, we're going to kill you, so don't let them get away. So anyways, it's pretty, pretty violent. What ends up happening, though, is they, they kill all of them. Um, and that's what ends up happening. Verse number seven, and it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jezreel. It's pretty vicious, right? Very, 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 very bloody. And, uh, and anyways, um, in verse number, verse number 10, now, know now that there shall fall into the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So, in the northern tribes, they're talking about God himself. Anything that God says, that's going to happen. In fact, there's not going to be a single commandment that's going to fall to the ground. The idea is, words coming from heaven, we're catching all of them, none going to waste. We're not spilling any of it. We're doing every single thing that God wants us to do. Does that sound like the northern tribes? No, not at all. Uh, Ahab, um, I'm sorry, uh, Jehu is slaying everybody. He's doing a lot of stuff. Verse 11, so Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his kinsfolk and his priests until he left him none remaining. And so there's a lot going on there. Uh, but it's not just that. If you look down into uh, verse number 18 in Jehu, um, Verse number 18, uh, verse number 18 says, And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Wait a second, wasn't he serving God? I'm going to do whatever God wants? Well, look, verse number 19. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. Sounds kind of terrible, like he's going to do a lot for Baal. But Jehu did it in subtility to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. So he's saying, oh, okay, I'm going to trick them, and we're going to get all the Baal worshipers to come over, and we're going to kill them all once we've got them all in one place. 
So this is Bible, people. Verse number 20. Uh, and Jehu says, said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came. So there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was full from one end to another. Don't think of a little 10 by 10 tent outside. This would have been a huge place. Probably hundreds if not thousands of people there. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And he brought them forth, brought them forth vestments, basically special clothes for them. Um, in verse number um, 24, and when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed four score men, 80, without, and said, if any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth them go, his life shall be for the life of him. It came, to, it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and slay them, and let none come forth. All right, so, so far, they've gotten rid of the house of Ahab. They've gotten rid of Jezebel. They've gotten rid of the kids that, that would have ascended to the throne after Ahab. Um, now, at this point, they've gotten rid of Baal worshipers. And what's going to happen next, they're going to take out... The columns are going to take out everything that was like important and sacred to Baal worship. They're going to take it all out. Baal worship is gone. And the king is saying, we're going to do everything God tells us. And I am fiercely loyal to God. In fact, he talks about, watch my zeal. Look at the zeal that I have for the Lord. In fact, he mentions that a little earlier. And so he does all sorts of stuff. Does that sound good or does it sound bad? Sounds good. Hey, wickedness taken out of the nation? Sounds excellent. But here's the problem. If you look down a little bit further in verse number 29, how be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And so if you know a little of the history as far as what happened when uh, Rehoboam basically split the kingdom because of his arrogance, um, they have an issue where the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes separate, right? Jeroboam was the first of the northern kings, and he was concerned because they were getting along and said, all right, this is the Lord, and God's allowed this. Um, but the northern tribes still needed to worship God, and they were going back to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. But he said, this is going to be a problem because they're going to want to stay there. We're going to get disruption, and we're going to have a civil war or something. So he sets up two golden calves. These golden calves were supposed to represent God himself. They had one in, in Dan, which is the northern part, and they had one in, um, in, the, the other part, in Bethel. And so having the, in both of those places, the goal was like, hey, you guys get to stay here, worship God, do your sacrifices without going all the way down to Jerusalem. And we just have a little replacement of them. But it's still God himself. Well, here's the problem. Not okay. In fact, by this, yes, they can claim one God and one God only. The problem is this, that they made a graven image and they worshiped that graven image. And because of that, they were disobeying the commandment of God and the, all of the zeal that they had with one God and God alone sounded great, except it was still a graven image. This is how serious it is. The other thing about that is when you have this issue of the graven images, we have to ask the question, why? And so look at a couple things about the commandment. Number one, the commandment is to make no idol. Uh, no idols. And so specifically, it's no graven image. The word graven literally means to carve out. Um, and so when we talk about that, you might say, well, wait a second. Um, all those other things are not necessarily carved out. For instance, you'll notice that a lot of things today are actually printed. Uh, you can go to a lot of people that worship a lot of other false gods, and they will print the images of what they think those are. Say, aha, they weren't graven. They were printed. Now, when you see the word graven, yes, it means graven. That's what it means. But there's going to be a number of passages, for instance, in the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah both, address the idea of graven and molten. And so molten would be that you make a cast for something, you would put the molten gold in there, and it comes out with a shape of it, right? Um, so that would be molten. Uh, but then you would have graven, that would be what Aaron did, is that he made it and then he he detailed it, and so he carved it out into exactly what he wanted. The, the concept, though, in those passages, it ties it in specifically still under this commandment in regards to this idolatry. And so it's not necessarily the idea that it's only cut out, graven in this special way, but it's more so addressing the problem at hand, and that's the, the, um, the idolatry by distracting us from worshiping the one true God by making a replacement for him. Now, the idea would be that we still believe in God, but we are going to change things in regards to worship, Changes worship of God altogether. 
Now, he says no, no graven image. I think the most defining mark on this is going to be specifically in verse number 5 when it explains why. Now, you'll notice verse 4 ends in a colon. It's going to explain what he means about this stuff. He said, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. And I'll explain all that in just a moment. But the idea here is that this is something set aside specifically for worship. And so, there are a lot of things. For instance, um, how many of you like pretzels? How many of you like pretzels? Now, do you realize something? Those pretzels, the reason, if you look at the history for that, those, the reason those pretzels were made up was actually to teach something. They were made up to teach the Trinity. They were literally a representation of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Aha, icons, graven images, molten bread, uh, whatever it may have been. But the whole point, it was designed to teach something. But now, does that mean, wait a second, does that mean we cannot eat pretzels in as Baptist good Baptist? pretzels never be allowed here. In fact, we won't even eat the stick pretzels because those came from the polluted circular thing pretzels or whatever they may have been. Um, no, not necessarily the case. All right, and we'll explain why here in just a moment. The other part is what about the egg? How many of you guys eat eggs? Any egg people? Now, eggs, how many times have you seen the egg illustration that to explain the trinity, you know, the shell, the white, and the yellow, which is, you know, it's fair to help us on that study. It's not, it's not a full understanding. By the way, one of the things I, I struggle with those explanations is because that's Jesus is not an egg, or God's not an egg, right? Um, but in, in the, 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 that correlation, it doesn't exactly make sense because, anyways, it's just not God. It's not, it's not the, the, the Godhead. And so, anyways, the point is it helps the idea of a three-in-one. So we get started. But does that mean, all right, Christians are not allowed to eat eggs any longer because of what they represent? Yeah, if we wouldn't do that kind of thing, would we? Well, what about, what about the pictures that we draw, the image that we would draw to show the Trinity? A circle, three circles connected by these lines, it would write, is not, is not, is not. And we'd say that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, is an image that's drawn. It says it represents the Godhead. Aha! Now we cannot draw it out. The only thing that we can do is we can explain it to people. And so does that mean then, or we can't use word pictures either for explaining it. And so the point is we can go very far in this, but I want you to notice what he explains in verse number five about why. What you are putting together is specifically for the worship of these things. And so those, those things that we're putting out there, um, should we be careful? Absolutely. We should not be putting things that represent God. We should not be. But specifically in these things, these representations of God, when we talk about these things, they, should, they ought not have any, any sort of form that gives them any sort of worship or reverence. Now, in that, when I say, well, it doesn't really represent God, um, but in these things, we hold it up into just a slightly higher esteem, and we're kind of afraid of those things that we're afraid of. For instance, the, um, uh, by the way, one, one more thing, uh, the candy canes, the, that, that's likewise to represent Christmas as far as J for Jesus, turn upside down, the shepherd's staff, and the red and white stripes, talking about his blood, and also the, the, the purity of Christ. And so you have all of those things put together, representations for those things, but they cannot represent God himself. And what he tells us here in this, those are supposed to be things that we ought to leave alone. In fact, in verse number four, he gives the restrictions for um, what we're allowed. And basically, it's nothing, all right? When we're, we are allowed, when we're considering what are we allowed as far as graven images, um, it cannot have any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or in the water under the earth, all right? So in order to represent God, you would have to find something that is neither in the water, basically subterranean in any level, or that lives on the ground or up at all. Like, oh, what about aliens? That would be considered the heaven up. All right, that, that's, that's that way. And so, uh, and, and, and anyways, the point is, none of those, so that means you are not allowed to use anything to take place of what God is like, his similitude, and we'll show that from the book of Deuteronomy in regards to similitude, because of the fact that you'll be distracting from who God is himself. Worship of God is a spiritual endeavor. We ought to worship in spirit and in truth because God himself is a spirit. That's why the Bible tells us. And so we are not to represent God by anything. Icons, images ought not to be around uh, Christians. And so we oftentimes will, um, from our backgrounds, oftentimes, um, and let's be honest, Catholicism is probably the, the biggest one of them. Uh, but also Lutheranism is very, very heavy in these things where they will come, they will actually kiss anything, any sort of images, anything that represents something spiritual, they would kiss it, they would sanctify it, and hope that there would be some kind of blessing attached.
That ought, be, that ought to be the case. should not be the case. Uh, I've seen a number of times where people will bow down to crosses that are made, literally two pieces of wood put together, or an image of it. Likewise, what we're doing is we're now sanctifying, we're now making this holy thing, which is literally just an item. And so in these things, he's saying that, not, that ought not be the case. Um, knowing that, what he's telling us here is that there's a reason for it. The, the reason for it is, according to verse 5, is that he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. Now, if we see images from other religions, they would have like a crocodile head or they would have like a fish head. Or what. Those were things that people have used in regards to their gods. For them, practically, in 12 chapters, they're going to have a calf, right? a little baby cow, if you will. Uh, and that's going to be what represents God. And this is wrong. This is wrong. And we'll explain some of the applications personally on this one. But the reason he tells us this is because God is a jealous God. In Deuteronomy chapter number 4, Verse 15, it says, take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. He's saying, watch out. Now, where else do we hear this type of language? Take heed unto yourselves about what? L lest ye fall. Uh, think the idea of being puffed up. And constantly the idea is that like, you pay attention because you could fall. And he's saying, in this case, when it comes to the family, he says, take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. The idea is not that it's an exact replica of a certain animal, but literally if it demonstrates any physical qualities to anything in creation, then it's lacking in regards to its representation of God. The likeness of any beast, according to verse 17, that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth, unless thou lift up thine eyes into, unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. What he points out here is that when you do have these other things that represent God, any sort of worship towards that, any, any sort of veneration that you would give to that item, claiming its worship to God himself, is that you are literally worshiping that item. You can find this from a number of passages, but let me go back just in thought here, back to the book of Exodus in verse, chapter 32. When they are making this feast unto the Lord, God says that they are worshiping other gods, plural. Oh, one calf and this feast to the Lord, but they're worshiping other gods, plural. So it doesn't matter what you think, the reality is you're worshiping something else. And so and it's very easy to get caught up in this because it feels sacred. For instance, if you ever go to a Catholic church, let's be honest, just about every Catholic church I've been to, and I've been a lot of them, are prettier or scarier, one of the two, uh, to, to, to our church, right? I mean, I've seen, I remember going to one, I went to this cathedral, and um, they were talking about just this one altar that they had. And they had this picture of Jesus in the tomb. And so there was this giant picture of Jesus on the tomb, this full-size picture. And, uh, and then the rest of it, originally it was covered in gold, and then people stole the gold, and then they covered it in silver. Like, oh, those poor people covered it in silver. Like, not like silver spray. We're talking about like actual silver that was put on these things. They had other ones that are covered in gold. And they're putting all these things out there, and they're beautiful. I've seen whole walls that are seemingly covered in gold, and they don't use like the stuff that looks like gold. It's not metallic finish, special spray paint from Krylon. These are actual, this actual gold that's put on these things. And in those things, it looks beautiful. And people come in there with this sacredness, like, oh, I'm now in this sacred place. And this is all representative of God himself. And what we're saying here is it's taken it away. How oftentimes do you see in depictions of Jesus or of God the Father an image of the sun around him? Is that by accident? Not remotely. There's a reason you can follow that in history where that comes from. In fact, you can find a lot of people that bash Christianity saying, we just ripped it off of other nations or other religions. Why? Because Catholics literally did that. God the Father representing the, the sun gods of other religions being brought in then to quote-unquote Christianity. And so you'll have this image of the sun, and what he says specifically in that is you would see the sun and you would worship that as if it was God himself. Oh, but this is all about God. My mind is on him. They say, no, it's still the other gods. Because our, end of imagina our, the, our imagination has no end. God is jealous. And the idea here is this. You're taking things away from him. 
Um, the Bible describes it repeatedly that God is a jealous God. Exodus 34, for thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. You see in Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5 and just repeatedly throughout the book of Daniel, Jeremiah and Isaiah constantly addressing this idea that God is jealous and he will not share his glory with another. And he even references not sharing it with graven images. Okay, and that's what happens. Oh, but it may represent God. Oh, no, this is just my way of worshiping God, which, by the way, is leading to something. When it comes to this, um, it's important to understand that all those things take away from the very person of God. If you look at Revelation and you see the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, not in his revealing to the earth, but when we talk about the scene, um, the scene in heaven, when, when you talk about, for instance, Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, um, the, just the beauty of, of God and, and, and the way that Jesus is manifest. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, when it talks about yeah, the, the, the very appearance, his eyes and his tongue and his hair, all of us describing his might and his power, anything less than that fullness is taken away from what Jesus really is. And so he's saying you're taking it away, you're replacing it. Oh, because it's kind of close. Let me give you an example. My wife and I have been married for 16 years. And because it would be unfitting for me to use this in any other way, imagine there was a, a beautiful young lady sitting here, and she looked a lot like my wife. She has brown, beautiful hair. She's, she looks like my wife. She looks just like my wife. And I go and talk to her, where are you from? Oh, you're from Tennessee. We well, you know my wife's from Tennessee. That's great. Well, you, you were born that year as well, my wife. And what if I started hanging out with her and started giving her attention? And you know what? Because she reminds me of my wife so much. July 7th, uh, this coming year for my anniversary, I'm not, I'm not only going to give my wife flowers, I'm also going to give this beautiful young lady flowers over here. And by the way, on camera, there's nobody there. All right. Um, but anyways, <laughs> this is important. If I say I give it to her, why? Because she's so similar to my wife. Would there be problems? Yes. yes. Understandably, right? Because similar is not the same. And so when we think about this, anything similar to our worship of God is not the same as God and should not be accepted amongst Christians to take things that are close. Things that are different are not the same, even if they're a little bit different. In this, he's describing that anything, anything else that's added or replacing God at all is something for which he shall because he owns that. He owns that worship. When a graven image gets some worship from God, and people do things. And you go down, and, and I remember going to a quinceanera when I was 15, 16 years old. I can't remember how old the, the girls turning 15. And I had to go forward to this. I didn't know much about it. I show up, and we're like, okay, the first part's going to be a Catholic church. Like, I didn't know it was going to be there. And so I go in, and, and they're like, all right, well, you just have to sit through this, and they're going to talk about a blessing for this girl. I didn't realize it would be like a mass for her, or actually for the dead, but then she would be blessed in, in that mass. And one of the things they said, are you going to come down here, and you're going you're gonna to bow? Because there's a statue of... I forgot what I was saying, Jesus maybe. Um, you're going to bow, and, um, and you're going to do something, a crucifix or whatever. And I said, no, I'm not. And so, and I, I had, I guess I was 16, because I'd just barely been saved. And so anyways, I make it to the front, and the person I'm with bows, they do their thing. I said, nope. And I go, and the priest, priest just looks at me. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do this. Uh, and so there's several things that they're saying. No, we can't do it. Why? Well, you know, wouldn't it just get me out of a situation here? Um, make it less awkward. I wouldn't wouldn't embarrass the family. I, I have to come before God for it. And for me to do so, oh, you know, we're just talking about Jesus. Don't you love Jesus? I do love Jesus. That is not Jesus. And so I will not give, according to verse number five, I will not bow to it. I will not serve it. And there's nothing that's going to get any attention what should be coming straight to God. We worship him in spirit directly, directly. Uh, the warning in verse number five, I thought today was going to be a really short message, by the way. All right, um, the warning here at the end of it, it says, For I am jealous, for I, the Lord thy God, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. People say right here, okay, so what does that mean? That, that means if you are idolatrous in some way, now not just talking about general idolatry, but about God himself not worshiping the way you're supposed to, then what's going to happen is your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will fall under the same curse and they will be judged by God in those things. There is personal responsibility, and you see it right in that verse. Where, where do you see that the personal responsibility? Of them that hate me. Now, this is an application to generations that would hate him. By the way, this is pointing further to the idea that to, um, to give any sort of uh, praise or any service or, or worship at all, any attention to these other things as being God in any way, 
What he's saying in those things is when you do this is a demonstration of hatred. And what he's pointing out here as this is something that would have far-reaching consequences both in scope of influence as well as the individuals that would commit these things by this hatred demonstrated for these generations. It's not going to be one and done. According to verse number 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The idea here is that God would show great mercy. What mercy? To anybody that would love God and give him that direct praise, that direct worship, the, the proper worship as God defines it here as opposed to those that would hate him by holding those things back. Now, in this, we know that families are affected greatly. Uh, if you think about it, for instance, uh, in Joshua chapter 7, you have Achan that goes and they, they, they go to invade uh, uh, you know, the city, Jericho, takes things he wasn't supposed to. Well, because of that, if he gets found out and he gets killed. If you remember that his household was killed with him, there's consequences for it. Listen, your sins, those things that you run to, those things that make you feel better about Jesus, maybe, uh, those things that are lucky, you know, I think those are things that would apply when we're like, oh, well, we have this faith in God. We don't believe in luck, but we're going to hang on to this because I just feel like it. those things are demonstrating a lack of faith in the one true God. And when you do those things, they affect how your household, your kids will see this, and it will likewise be shared into generations to come. Um, we won't get into the sins of the father right now, but there's, there's more to have there. Um, the idea here, uh, Ahab, for instance, 70 of his sons were killed. Nineveh talks about the thousands and thousands that could not distinguish between the right and the left. The idea would be children um, that would be killed because of the wickedness of that city. And so generations that take an idolatry will have consequences for that. Um, there's there's um, in the book of Acts, I won't go to it, but in the book of Acts, chapter 17, Paul goes to Athens. Uh, while he's in Athens, he, he preaches there burdened. And by the way, when he first gets there, he sees the whole city was wholly given to idolatry because of that. It says, therefore, what does he do? Therefore, he goes and he preaches there at the synagogue. He's like, hey, we got to tell people about Jesus and tells anybody that would be willing to listen, the people you would think, the ones that are talking about the Messiah. He goes and tells them first, but then the other guys from, from the area, the, other, the Athenians go and they want to listen to him. But, uh, but he preaches a message starting in verse 25. I encourage you to read that sometime. But when he talks about the fact that the unknown God is the one God, and anything that's not him is taken away from him. Um, verse number 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, the idea of we are, we are made by God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He is not any, any image that you can possibly think of. It's not him. He's only the God of the Bible. So in application, let me just draw this uh, to a close here with a couple thoughts. One, when you look at the New Testament, Jesus takes the Ten Commandments, and, um, and we'll get into some of the, the more complicated ones. I know the ones specifically probably most questions will be asked about is the Sabbath. But, but in those things, um, Jesus speaks about the Ten Commandments. And, um, and anyways, in those, he will expand on these things, talk about the heart nature of the commandments. For instance, adultery, how important it is that adultery not be committed even in your heart. Hatred of a brother, likewise, comparing it to that, that sin of murder, uh, of killing, and obviously being wrong. And so with this, in the book of Colossians, we see an application of this, because you might be saying, well, wait a second, I have no graven images. I have no image made up of, of God himself, which I venerate in any way. I say, I'm doing, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, we can apply other principles in regards to idolatry, how idolatry in any manner should be thrown out. Th those are, might may be cool. They're neat points of history and relics and, and a lot of people. But the reality is they, they represent false gods. So it's okay to remove them, take them out, and advisable to do so. But when it comes to the worship of God himself, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and the one I want to focus on now is, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The thing that's interesting about covetousness is not just that we covet, but we seek those things for that satisfaction. And as Christians, we seek things, the, uh, whatever maybe, maybe material or immaterial, thinking that it could satisfy in the way that only God can. And he says that it's idolatry. 
tying it in there into regard, in regards to what that is um, for, for us. So we, as an American society, feel we're so advanced from idolatry that we don't do that kind of stuff, and yet we are a nation steeped in covetousness. Our, all our holidays are built around that in some way. Every single holiday is going to be geared towards covetousness. You're going to have Grandmother's Day. You're going to have sprained wrist day or broken wrist day, I'm sure, and, and have some kind of guilt about what you should be doing for those people and the type of candy they should be getting, the card they'll be getting. And there's always some brand new holiday about what you need to be buying and spending. Everything's overly commercialized. But the point is, is covetousness. There's this need to have an, an unsatisfaction unless you do have it. That is the Bible, what the Bible describes, idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Perhaps most practically today, there's elements of covetousness that are present in Christian lives. Um, the other part I want to mention here is this, that when it comes to uh, our worship of God, we want to re be reminded specifically while it tells them one God, commandment one, the other part is this, that you have to worship God one way, one way, the way that God wants. Today, we are in a society that is gearing worship to whatever man is. In fact, there are whole churches and denominations that are saying say they're even their music of worship. I, I want to remind you, worship is not just music. But they'll take that, and the idea that worship to God then is a music genre that most satisfies your flesh in the way that you would give that to appease or appeal to God. And that cannot be the case. God has to be worshipped according to what he is in the purity and the beauty of himself. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing according to what God wants. While we may make decisions that are a little safer, we do want to make sure that we're not crossing the bounds of pleasing ourselves, worshiping in a way that we think, well, God will like me for who I am. Do you realize that we don't come to God based on who we are? We come to him based on who he is. We come to him because he is merciful. We, we, um, he doesn't owe us a thing. And so with this, we come to him because he is the one that's worthy of it. Uh, in these, I want to remind you of just one more verse, and then, then we'll be done for tonight. Leviticus 26 and verse 1. Ye shall make no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto, for I am the Lord your God. Anything that takes the, that place, that, that veneration, that, that the worship from you, uh, that should be directed towards God, that needs to be removed from our lives. You'll notice, by the way, he tells them that in that passage in Leviticus, say not even stones set up. The stones were important. Uh, the stones set up things. They were supposed to be memorialized, but they were not supposed to be bowed to. So he's saying, the stones are okay. The problem is the, the bowing was the problem. And so in those things, he's uh, telling them what to do. Um, doesn't mean that you can't engrave in anything. The, the Bible talks about graving certain things in. Uh, the book of Leviticus, the book of Exodus talks about the priest's garments, the temple, things that should be shown in there. A lot of symbolism that's put in there. Uh, symbolism is not a bad thing. But, again, nothing that should take our reverence, all right? Um, there's more. Uh, Galatians 6.18 is a good passage when it talks about that as well, uh, things that we shouldn't have present. Um, I skipped one whole, one whole point on the warning in regards to the fathers, but we'll, we'll get to that in another message. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you for the time you've given, the opportunity to look at your word. I'm praying that you would help us in our, uh, our walk with you, Lord, that we would make, make you most important in our lives, that we would worship you the way you want to be worshipped, that our lives would be pleasing to you. We'd offer up ourselves living sacrifices in a manner that, that you're okay with, not the one that we want to provide for you, but the one you want us to provide for you. I'm praying, Lord, that we would satisfy the, the necessity of worship before you in a way that you're pleased with, in a way that we're reminded constantly of scriptures that we're to do so in spirit and in truth. Thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.